All right, um, so agenda, so we're gonna set up a couple things. We're gonna talk about the, for the decision that we made um, in December of last year, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, then we're gonna talk about what our goals were, and I, we did our own retrospective, and then how we got to uh, our own lessons learned and what we were gonna share with you. And then at the end, I'm, I'm gonna try my best to save time for a Q&A. Uh, but before we get started, Omid wasn't able to be here today, and uh, he wanted to share a quick word with you, so we had him do this fun recording, and hopefully everybody can hear this and the AVL works. Eric, thanks for the opportunity to introduce this session. So this session is really an idea from Tom McQuillan, who posted on LinkedIn that he would love to see the lessons we learn from developing LabVIEW NXG. What you're about to see is a version of an internal review we did of this project, the lessons we learned, and how we're applying those lessons going forward. Now, I'm disappointed I won't be there to hear your comments directly, but I encourage you to share your feedback and comments with the NI team, and I look forward to reading about them after the event. Eric, back to you. Thank you, Omid. All right, so just make sure we're all on the same page. We announced back in Q4 of 2020 uh, that we were releasing the last version of LabVIEW NXG uh, January, which we did earlier this year. Um, we are continuing forward with a large amount of the NXG platform technology, which we'll talk about here today, including things like the LabVIEW NXG web module, which we've now renamed to the G Web Development Software. That will continue on. Um, we'll continue the rest of the platform that was built on that same NXG stack, so Instrument Studio, which you heard about earlier today, FlexLogger, the Digital Pattern Editor, um, and we'll be pulling some of that uh, technology actually back into LabVIEW, and there'll be questions about that later on in the session. So just want to make sure everybody heard that message at some point before you showed up here at this uh, session today, right? Yeah, okay, great. All right, so now, look at the goals that we had for doing the retrospective. So. Um, as they were introducing this, yeah, LabVIEW and XG was a big project for us. Um, and it had a, a lot of lessons learned uh, to be gathered from it. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we understood what were the key issues and the challenges that we had throughout the lifespan of the product. It was a big window of time, which we'll talk about. Uh, then we wanted to make sure that we talk about how do we um, prevent ourselves from falling into some of the pitfalls that we fell into, and how do we apply a lot of the lessons learned going forward? Because there were really good things that we did and learned in that LabVIEW NXG project. Um, maybe not the product itself, but a lot of the things that we put in to make the product work, okay? Um, and then sharing the experience and learning, not just within our own organization, because uh, not everybody at NI works on all the projects that we build, right? So just because there was a lot of lessons learned for the LabVIEW and XG team, doesn't mean that everybody else at NI understood those. So we wanted to make sure that we could share that as a broader lessons learned throughout the company. But then as Omid just said, uh, we wanted to make sure that we could share that with a broader audience as well, because a lot of the things we learned are situations that you might run into in the work that you do with your own customers. And we wanted to make sure that we could share that learning too because we thought that was important uh, that you take something away from this. And so in the nature of those two things, we're gonna set up a couple of things. So one, just as a reminder of the, the broad window of timeline that we're talking about for NI, uh, we, we started doing a large amount of the evaluation all the way back in 2007. Okay, so we're talking about things from 2007 up till 2020 is the window of time I'm covering now for what we did a retrospective on. That's a really big window of time. Um, the approach that we took, all right, so internally what we did was you asked anybody who had ever done any type of interaction with LabVIEW NXG, give us all the feedback that you have, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Um, and then, we, you know, we, anybody used Mur Mural as a technology? All right, so all my NI team has used Mural, a couple of people external. If you haven't, this is a really cool web technology. It's like the Post-it notes, except it's all in the cloud, and you just throw Post-it notes everywhere. So we brainstormed a whole bunch of stuff. Just show us all the things that you want to make sure that we get covered in this retrospective. And then we tried to group these into different ways of learning. Um, we went across the spectrum. It, this was everything from our sales team to our development team uh, to the marketing and engagement team. Uh, we, we really tried to like, make sure that we covered all the bases. Um, in the end, uh, we tried to distill all of what we had learned down, and we ended up with 17 key takeaways. In 45 minutes, there's no possible chance that I can cover that broad of a window of time, much less the 17 key takeaways, so I'm gonna talk about four of them today, and they all fit into one of these three categories of process, strategy, and technical implementation. All right, so my high-level takeaways, I've got four things that I'm gonna talk about. We're gonna go back and forth between all of these and understand that None of them is an island. They don't exist by themselves. They all actually interact with each other, so you're gonna hear me mention these 
all over the place even when I'm focused on one of the other topics. So one topic is the ability to listen more, right? The next one is the ability to solicit for feedback and actually understand what feedback you're being given. A third category we lovingly called acknowledging reality. Um, a lot of the presentations that you guys hear today, um, Brian's in particular, I was very, uh, I was paying very deep impact to a lot of, a lot of the feedback that you were, you were covering here because sometimes you just have to acknowledge reality and that means you've got to go back and question things that you've previously treated as being true. Um, and then this last one is, the, is a focus um, on sustainable technical investment. And those words are really important. When we get to that section, I'll explain what I mean by sustainable technical investment. All right, so we're going to start out with listening more. So this is a big one for us. Let's start out with easy things. Some of you saw this one this morning. As soon as we started talking about NXG, these comments came up, both internal and external to the company of like, wait, but Joel said we should never do these things. This is one of the very key ten ten tenets. Never just start over again. It's a terrible idea. Yes, we all acknowledge that we'd read that article, and sometimes you pay attention to pieces of it and not to others. And even Joel fell into this category, which is the second one. I think you need to see both of these articles and you need to understand the window of time between them. So after Joel did this article, six years later, his company actually started all over again on a, on a piece of technology. When he was asked later, but you said never do this, he said, okay, there's two key, two key things that we learned that I'm going to clarify of, it's sometimes okay to do this, which is why you then ask the question of like, well, is it okay to restart over? Yes, but there's some things you should think about. So this one is actually six lessons learned from people who started over, and sometimes that works out. And when you distill down, well, what works? They, there's two things. One, they didn't try to rebuild exactly the same product they had. They were, might be trying to save, solve the same problem. So there might be a lot of customer overlap, and they're so, trying to solve similar challenges, but they were actually building a different product. Right? And the second one is they didn't then sunset their existing product. Right? Uh, for those of you who had talked to us about what we're doing for LabVIEW and XG, we were trying to do both of those things. We we're trying to reinvent the wheel and replace the existing project and add some new stuff to it. I mean, it was a lot of and 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 it just kind of grew. All right, so at the time when we were starting this, NI was proceeding on an inside out pursuit of platform replacement. We were actually looking at things that didn't work very well in LabVIEW and saying, how can we fix that? And we were doing it from inside the company, all right? When you're in, looking inside the company and you're trying to make a platform replacement, one of the things that always comes up is the Osborne effect. Everybody know what the Osborne effect is? No, I see a lot of people shaking heads, so I'll explain the Osborne effect. The Osborne effect is what happens to companies like this, the Osborne computer, which is what it's named for, um, Sega Dreamcast. There's lots of examples. If you Google um, Osborne effect later on, you'll see this. What it means is a company announces ahead of time that they're building a next generation product. It's going to replace the thing that's already out there. They're doing that to try to drum up excitement, right? We're like, hey, yay, there's this new thing coming, cool. What actually ends up happening is people stop buying the current product because they're expecting the next product to come out and the company blows up, okay? So it's a bad thing and lots of companies look at that and say, well, it's sometimes I still want to do that work. I need to replace the product, but I don't want to have the negative impact of every, all my customers going away. So what do you do? You don't tell people about the new thing that you're building. So you, you know, that big window that we, time that we had, we didn't tell people, we weren't talking about what we were doing, we were just doing it. And that's, that's the inside out approach. We were thinking about what we needed to do, not talking to other people about what they needed. If you fast forward in time later in the project, so this is, that's 2010's mentality, this is 2016's mentality, so just to give you two windows of time. Anybody in this picture actually in this room right now? So I realized what the group is. All right, so this, this is a CLA summit, right? At one of our CLA summits, this is NI, this is our corporate headquarters building. We brought in a bunch of people and started showing them, here's what we're building. And why did we do that? In this group, this is some of our most trusted audience. We're specifically selecting you and saying, we want your feedback because we want you to help us make this thing successful. And we need your input to do that. That is an outside in philosophy. And that is driving a whole lot of NI's business. So when you later say, why did things change? This was part of what we were doing. If you look at NI today, we have a very different model um, in your session that you were just talking about that, you know, we were showing how the BUs were formed, right? So we have these business units looking at things. That is all part of an outside end, trying to better understand what our customers are doing and making sure that that's part of the, the workflow that you're doing. Not trying to do everything ourselves and not just, you know, sealing ourselves inside a bubble, right? Um, also part of this outside in philosophy, 
Who can tell me, like, we, we did this big announcement in 2019, who can tell me what are, th- what are the three tenets that NI promoted about our business? What do we say about ourselves? We are, I'll give you the first one, we are bold. What's the second one? Kind. kind. What's the third one? Connectors. connectors. Bold, kind, connectors. We were not talking about any of those three things, and we were trying to redefine how NI did things. What we were trying to do at that time, people didn't understand. Let me explain what we were doing. People wanted to know, why are you doing things differently? NI, why are you doing things differently? We don't understand what you're doing. And we were trying to explain in simple words, here's what's driving our business. If you want to know what drives our business now, it's being bold, being kind, and being connectors. And the inside out philosophy breaks two of those fundamentally, right? It is not being bold, which includes being accountable for what we're doing. We were trying to build everything under the sun and then replace an existing product. That's not being bold. That's actually just doing a replacement. And we were not being connectors. We didn't engage anybody in the discussion. We were just doing what we needed to do. Now, that's not the same as saying we didn't have conversations about it. We have smart people at the company, but we weren't engaging our customers in the discussion. All right, so then the other part that you can look at is like LabVIEW's focus. Well, from an outside in, back in 2006, anybody remember that picture from NI Week? Do you remember what we called it? This is like how long-termers, do you remember what Dr. T talked about this one on stage? It had a name. What did we call that thing? Remember it rotated, that disk on top looks like something. What? The flux capacitor. The flux capacitor. We called this guy the flux capacitor. Okay, so in this model, LabVIEW is the center of the universe. Everything filters into it and out of it. Right? We connect to all of our hardware and all of our software connects to it. That's great. From an inside out perspective, it, it mer- simplifies how NI would do business. Everything goes to LabVIEW. But it's terrible from an outside in. What are we talking about now? What are the features that are now in LabVIEW? Python integration. We're integrating with MATLAB. We're integrating with C++. I mean, we're looking from an outside in saying, LabVIEW, it's great that LabVIEW can do all these things, but LabVIEW is not the center of the universe. You're working on these systems. You're building systems of stuff, and systems aren't designed just by using LabVIEW. They're used a huge ecosystem, and we have to connect to that ecosystem. So now if you look at NI, you fast forward to today, NI.com actually talks about, well, you're building this test and measurement system which has these huge connectivity components, and LabVIEW is the ideal language to do that with, but it works with everything else. Right? So that's just a fundamental shift in how we look at the world. All right, so that's number one. Um, I'm also gonna ask you to just wait till the end to like write your questions down, ask them at the end or otherwise I'll never get through it. (laughs) All right, so soliciting feedback, all right? So now we're trying to be connectors, right? We're looking for ways to solicit feedback. So in 2020, this just tells you a little bit about how late into the process we started doing some stuff. Um, In 2020, we did this big survey. We said, hey, start telling us what you're looking for. I don't think anybody in this room is really surprised by the first thing on this list, but we learned that the vast majority of our customer base was extremely satisfied with the current version of LabVIEW that they were using. In other words, they were trying to tell us that NXG thing that you keep trying to tell us is going to be so awesome, we're not really looking forward to that. We're actually just fine with what you've given us today. Now, there's things that we want you to do with it that it doesn't do today, so we don't want you to just leave it alone, but we're okay with what you gave us. LabVIEW is really good. Um, the, this other piece, you know, the barriers to adopting LabVIEW and NXG, when we were looking at it from the outside in, the philosophy was when you start your next project, start with NXG. Okay? Everybody in the room understand, like, that's totally what you would have done. Yeah, there's zero hands for the audience back at NI. There's zero hands being raised. Um, what we, when we started doing this survey and we started engaging with these customers, they told us, look, that's a great idea, but that's not what actually happens. What actually happens is I've got this huge library of code that I've already built, and even if the next thing that I'm building isn't exactly that, I draw off those libraries. I bring those libraries into the next project, and I use that as a starting point. And if you're not going to give me a good way to migrate from LabVIEW to LabVIEW and XG, that's going to be a massive problem for me. All right, so the other thing that we did, solicit feedback, and then remember, what was the second part? Solicit feedback and? Understand it. Okay, so we get to Agile. We, had, we brought in some consultants and said, all right, this project has taken us a lot longer than we thought. We're smart people. We know we can figure it out, but we need some help. Like, something's going on. And the Agile consultant said, well, we think you could actually make some significant improvements by doing some quick changes um, and improving your risk management, your process, and a lot of things that go into that. But we actually didn't understand this feedback. So look at, look at the scores. So in the, the scores that the Agile and consultants gave us, I mean, they're pretty low on basically every aspect of the analysis. And we looked at that, and they, their feedback was, you've got to simplify your code. And we looked at it and said, but it's a complex problem. Of course, the solution's got to be complex. 
Right? That was actually our feedback, right? So we had this, you know, this look of the world, and we're like, we, we just don't understand what you're actually trying to tell us. Um, and that, I'll come back to this slide, but this one was really important because once we did start understanding this, we started making a lot of changes. So it's not that we didn't ask for feedback in this case, we just didn't understand what we were being told. All right, this last piece uh, that talks about seeking feedback. At the time, inside NI, the team working on the project, this was not a speak up culture. This was a, we're getting this done, put your nose to the grindstone and do it. That, that doesn't work inside the company just like it didn't work outside the company, right? You, you actually have to ask the people who are working on the project, how is this going? And once we started embracing a speak up culture, which the current management team heavily influenced our ability to do, right? They, they came in and we made a lot of changes and they basically said, look, you have to tell us what's going on so we can actually address the problems because otherwise sometimes we're blind to the problems that are going on. So we had to embrace a speak up and tell us what's going on technology, which now pervades our entire development team. We, we change the way we do development at NI. Okay, this last category that I'm going to talk about, uh, sorry, this is the third of four categories I'm going to talk about, um, acknowledging reality. All right, so things that we were doing, you know, Brian had this cool presentation which talked about like it was a good idea, but in the end it was, that was not quite accurate. We, we were looking for ways to metric and determine success. We realized this project was going on for a while, it was taking us time. We said, okay, well, what kinds of ways can we use to metric it? Well, the initial ones we used is we're shipping products based on it, right? We ship things like DAC Express and the LabVIEW comms. Anybody in here use LabVIEW comms? LabVIEW communication design suite? No? Not very, like a handful? Okay. So we shipped those things and they were out in the marketplace and they were being used, but we weren't doing, there wasn't a full circle um, review of that being done. Yeah, we shipped it, but people who were using it were trying to give us feedback and we weren't hearing the feedback they were giving us. Right, so um, we needed to complete the circuit on listening to the feedback and acknowledge the reality. Just because we were shipping products doesn't mean the product was actually in good shape. Um, and then the last thing that's on here that's really important, we were prioritizing certain things over others. In this case, we were prioritizing feature velocity and we were sacrificing the code quality and the architecture to get it. Right, where there were very stiff demands on get this thing done, get it shipped, get it going. And because we were doing it as a platform replacement, we had a pretty good idea of what we needed to build. It has to do everything that LabVIEW can do. And then a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, that's, the, that's what we were saying. It has to do everything LabVIEW can do, and then it has to do some other stuff. And it has to do it different than LabVIEW was doing it. Um, and so we were, in the name of trying to complete the platform and make it comparable with what LabVIEW could do, we were sacrificing other stuff and building up technical debt. All of these pieces are what I'm about to talk about next. All right, so... One of the things that we were doing is if we were, if we were um, spinning our wheels and we were you know, trying to get everything based on the schedule, uh, we were struggling with understanding what our velocity was. Right? We didn't have good metrics around like how much work are we getting done, why is the schedule changing? Um, and so we started implementing, instead of these high level swags, we started implementing person quarters of work. And we got really good at estimating person quarters of work, especially for things that we were doing in the near term. So things that we we're doing in the next year, we could actually, we can now, pretty well um, defined, this is how much work we were gonna get done. Uh, we moved from, uh, when we started it was build NXG, which is this gigantic, huge thing, which anybody who's ever worked on a large scale project knows the first thing you should do with that is break it up. <laughs> you can't, can't possibly define like the large scale thing, you gotta break it up into pieces. Um, and even a company the size of NI with the experience that we have, we could still fall into that pit. And we did, and so one of the things that we started getting better at was making sure that we defined this velocity that we could work at, and then we're executing to the velocity. Um, and then the last thing that we did that was like ignoring parts of reality is we would look at what needed to be done from the feature aspect, but the other piece of what needed to be looked at is everything else, like the tech deck that we were creating. We didn't have a way of classifying what the tech deck looked like. We had, we had bugs that we were filing, but we weren't including that in the work we were getting done. So sometimes we would add more features and not address the bugs that we already knew about. Um, whereas the, the, the part that we've done today, so like this last slide is, well, how have we changed? And this next slide is like one of my favorite things ever and I'm gonna credit JR, he's on the call here. Um, there was a lot of people that went into building uh, these views, uh, but JR kind of forced us to look at it and say, okay, we've gotta get better at like driving the cars down. We have to be honest about the work that we still have left, which means we can't know that we have this giant backlog of bugs 
and say that everything's healthy. So we have these donuts now and we show how much work are we putting in for each cycle that we work on that goes into bugs, features, tech debt, and other stuff, right? So we are honest and upfront and we constantly update these things. And we track the project based on the whole picture, not just how many features have we done, but how much work are we doing and how healthy is the product, right? And then the other, the other part is we have to do that on a cyclical basis, so we now have a very predictable schedule. Virtually the entire um, software stack at NI and a lot of the hardware products, um, and somebody online may give me a comment later, which you guys can tell me if they're typing in, if all of R&D, but mo most of R&D is driven by these cycles where we try to line up all of our work and it's kind of like the train leaving the station now. We know when work needs to get done. If it doesn't get done, it'll roll into the next cycle and it's fine. But we're trying to make sure that the product is healthy on a very predictable basis. All right, so this last category that I'm getting to, which, oh wow, I'm doing good. All right, focus on sustainable, I'll have lots of time for Q&A then, that's fantastic. Uh, focusing on sustainable technical investments. All right, so. Um, there was a bunch of things in this category, although it doesn't show up so well on the slide. Well, the things, I'm only focusing on three of the ones that are on this slide. They are the architectural simplicity, the technical debt, and the code quality. Um, later on, if you all want like a more in-depth analysis, I can go into in pretty good detail on a lot of these. Um, and we may do a completely different session for the GLA. That's one of the questions that I have for you, of, like how should we change this presentation up? Um, but we're gonna cover these three as being particularly impactful. So. Um, remember that th this entire category is sustainable technical investment, right? So what does that mean? Um, I, I mentioned the, the Agile consultants coming in earlier and giving us feedback. Um, we, we got that feedback 2013. We started understanding it later. 20, 2016, 2017, we started actually understanding what they were really talking about. They said, reduce complexity. And we said, but well, it's a complex problem. We have a complex solution to com solve a complex problem. We don't understand the problem. Um, what they were actually saying is, it, you, you're, you're making every problem really hard. You're focusing on every little detail and you're trying to do everything perfectly and all your solutions are just massively complicated and then you're building up this technical debt and not bringing it back down as you make changes. So that leads to like, well, we have an abstraction problem. We actually need to go back and look at how do we solve a complex problem without making a complex solution. All right, so when it requires, <laughs> architectural simplicity requires maintenance, so this is, uh, or maintenance architectural evolution. Do this, anybody know what that animal is? That's, a, that's an antelope, it's a springhorn antelope. And this is cheetah, all right. Relationship between these two animals? Yeah, pre prey, <laughs> prey predator. Now, if, if you'll notice what I labeled them as, do this, be the antelope, not this. All right, what's, what's in nature, if this is prey and predator, there's designed to balance, there's a checks, checks and balances going on, otherwise, all the predators would massacre all the prey and there wouldn't, everybody would die out. So the balance is, how fast can a cheetah run? Anybody know? Oh, it's it's, it's top speed, 75 miles an hour roughly. How long can it run that distance, that speed for? Yeah, one minute, top. So cheetahs, if you ever watch a nature show on cheetahs, they have one minute and after that, they're done for basically the day. Like that's it, at, a, at full sprint, that's as fast as they can go. How fast can its prey, the antelope, run? So 75 miles an hour, how fast can the prey run? 60 miles an hour, and how long can it run for? Not forever, but it can run for a good 30 minutes, right? So if the cheetah doesn't catch it in that first minute, that, that antelope's gone, right? And the cheetah's screwed for a day. Now, when you have that kind of en energy expenditure, a cheetah can only afford to miss one or two meals. If it misses more than that, it can't get to top speed anymore, and now it's done. So this is a really important thing. When we started looking at this, we were trying to go for all-out velocity, cheetah. Get this thing done, get it as fast as possible, get it out the door. Okay, that was not sustainable, totally not the right thing to do. We need to be more like the antelope, where we need to have good velocity, but it needs to be sustainable velocity. And we've got to do it for a long period of time. We've got a, a lot of work we need to do. We have to do it for long windows. Right, so sustained velocity is the key. What that meant to us, like once we finally learned this, like here's some important lessons learned to take out of that. What does that mean? Do not allow your code to get messy. You have got to keep your code clean. So going back and relearning that lesson after doing it for like a decade the other way, really, really painful. Okay, so keep your code clean. Refactor as you need it. 
However, so this is like you guys have already brought up this point in other sessions, only refactor what you need. Just because the thing is messy doesn't mean it's wrong. You can leave code alone and not go back and refactor it every time you need to do something. That's, that's trying to over perfect it. And that was also the part of the feedback we were getting of like, don't go for perfection, fix what needs to be fixed, like be real and be, you know, make sure that you're fixing what needs to be fixed, but don't, don't try to fix everything. Okay, we also, inside the company, anybody heard the term code owners? This is not a term we created, but it's a term that we use a lot. So code owners came to own, they, they own segments of code. Whenever anybody puts code into there, they're responsible for making sure that the code health overall is still good. Now that's probably not impactful if you're doing all the work yourself, you'd just be talking to yourself all the time. Um, but when you're talking to team, big teams of developers, it's really important to make sure that you've got lots of people who can add code to your code base. But in the end, you got one person who's responsible for that code base being healthy. And they can come back and say, you need to do some more work here, you need to re-architect for the thing, you, the thing you put in is good, but you need to re-architect these other pieces to account for that work you just did. So you're not done with your job yet, right? Um, and you can't need to constantly reevaluate abstractions. So one of the things that we said was, if we design it all really well from the beginning, we won't need to ever come back and touch it again. Everybody thinks that's a great idea, right? <laughs> okay, this, this group has had multiple presentations today where I was like, yeah, you're gonna hear that again from us, so it's, it's fine. Um, so you'd need to reevaluate those abstractions. You need to come back to them. As you make changes, you need to constantly keep the code healthy. That means you have to have things like these code owners. You need to come back to it. You cannot sprint towards everything, you actually have to take the time to do the work that's necessary. All right, so your code reflects intent and it needs to be evolved over time. Um, and then you need to push changes through all of your code. That was all the other purpose of the code owners is to make sure when you make a change, sometimes you think it's isolated, but it's not actually isolated. And that, re that involves a more senior person reviewing your code and saying, actually what you just did was you broke these other three pieces and you're ne gonna need to go touch them now too. Okay, and then you need to be looking at the um, feature work, and not always just, the, you know, you need to balance feature work and tech debt. Okay, so that leads to our second category in this group, technical debt. <laughs> Everybody understand technical debt, especially in the, the guise of this picture? Right, technical debt's one of those things where it, it can build up slowly over time, it can be deceitful, it doesn't look like anything big, but over time it becomes unmanageable until you can't move anymore, right? The mule's up in the air, that's unfortunate. All right, so uh, this is how we describe technical debt. I don't understand why it takes you so long to add a window, but the house is just all beat up, like there's no place to put a window. So first I gotta go fix the house, and then I can add, tell you how to add a window. All right, so schedule, when we started, I've, I mentioned this before, schedule was the sole priority. Keep everything on schedule, sacrifice anything at all to get it, and that's, that's okay. But what we learned, and it's not like this is a new lesson, but what we learned and then relearned uh, to go fast, you actually have to go well. That means doing maintenance on your code. So you can't allow the technical debt to build up. Okay, so, and then uh, at the end of the day, what you're targeting is you know, the outcome, not the code itself. So make sure that you're focusing on the things that will have the biggest impact. So this was, again, feedback from the consultant of, you don't need to fix everything. You need to fix the things that need to be fixed. So we started thinking like, well, what things will impact my future velocity? If something's gonna impact my ability to make future changes, that's probably something I need to change. If this thing is ugly, but it really doesn't cause me any problems going on, why not just leave it alone? I mean, the, there's a little bit, okay, everybody in the room will understand this next time. There's a little bit of us that wants to say, but it's ugly, I want it to be pretty, I want it to be best code it can be. I get it, but fight that part of you. Ask some more questions before you decide, like, I gotta go fix everything. All right, um, make an honest evaluation. So this is like the ignoring reality uh, component, right? Of, you know, make sure that you're saving time to do tech debt work. Make sure that you're saving time to go address bugs. It, there was a point in time where I showed that donut and like 90% of that donut would have been feature work and we would have been like, yes, that's awesome. We're making this great velocity. But we were, in the meantime, we were hiding the fact that we were building up this big technical debt and we weren't addressing all these bugs. And the real donut should have looked like this is a terrible, we were doing terrible this quarter. We should have done something different than what we did, all right? Um, and then some examples, some concrete examples just over time. In 2011, we had, I, I don't know how many people were like, st anybody come and see LabVIEW NXG in the 2011 kind of time frame? At gyms, probably like, the, there was so, there, yeah, Jeremy. All right, so at that time, one of the things that I thought was cool about LabVIEW NXG is we said, hey, look, we're gonna have this public API. 
you can extend LabVIEW and XG any way you want to because we're just going to publish what the API looks like. It's a great idea. It was really terrible in, from an implementation standpoint because this is a crap ton of work. Every single thing you do has to have this public API and you have to document it. What we ended up doing towards the end was we said, you know what, we don't, probably don't need to document absolutely everything or at least not from the very beginning. Maybe over time we get to a point where it's all documented, but what we do need to document is things that are actually important to people, workflows that our development team and that you guys would want to be able to use, that has to be documented. Right? We have to give you the power to be able to extend what we've given you that's important. And that made a huge difference. Then we could actually do this task we could do. This task became impossible to complete. All right, so then that gets to code quality. Um, this one should be self-explanatory. There's an obvious relationship between uh, the maintenance of the code, your, you know, the total cost to maintain your code uh, will go down as you improve the code quality um, oh, that you've created, right? It's easier to maintain it if you've made it good from the beginning. So, you know, it makes it so that it's easier to modify, there are fewer bugs, and um, not trivially, there are happy developers. Like, people will actually leave if you make the code impossible for you to be able to work in and modify. All right, so one, one major problem that we had um, was improving, by the time we were doing things like this, improving the code base in, a, in an existing large um, project was a daunting task. Doesn't mean we didn't do it, because that's, that's the work that needed to be done, but it, it's bigger if you don't start out that way. Okay, so this was an example. I hadn't actually seen this commercial before, but does everybody recognize the geometric progressions commercial? This is a progressive commercial. Um, and they were showing the impact that making small financial changes now has on your ability to retire later. That was their point. But if you Google geometric progressions, it talks about each one of these is a domino that's 50% larger as you go down. And by the time you get to the this is like the 17th domino. Now you're talking about something that can crush the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And by the time you get to, I don't remember what it is, but it's ridiculously small, like the 45th uh, domino can hit the moon. So uh, geometric progressions progress really, really big over time. And so find the things that are the small dominoes that you can change that have bigger influence later on. That's tricky, but that's the, that's the objective. So what we did was we focused on small things that we knew would have a big impact later on, like enforcing code reviews. Um, <clears throat> making sure that the code was readable, um, that there was descriptive naming, uh, that we did um, automated testing as much as we could, um, and instilling a mindset of not letting things go. So we shifted the entire mindset and said, it's not about the schedule, now it's about code quality, and we have to be able to go back and do things. And the results of that, I, I thought they were surprising, because I, I, you know, going back and working on the same code that you've already worked on, that gets boring for developers. That it's more exciting to work on new features. But the results of this were the entire team felt empowered to make a good quality product. That has its own rewards. Right? The team felt like, hey, cool, we can go back and tell you when things need to be fixed, and then you'll tell us that it's cool to go fix them. And then it also creates a, a, a willingness to go back and refactor, to do the rework that needs to be done. So um, that was a really nice uh, benefit. All right, so these were our High-level takeaways, just tell them what you told them. Listen more, solicit and understand the feedback, um, acknowledge reality, and then focus on sustainable investments. So I'm gonna end here on questions. I actually have one more slide at the end, um, but this is where I'm gonna give you two things that are questions. Uh, questions that you might have. So the, the one that I'm starting out with by default is, well, what are the features that you did do for LabVIEW and XG that are coming back in the LabVIEW? <laughs> if that's your question, come to my session tomorrow. I'm actually gonna be talking about that. It's tomorrow at three o'clock. Um, what else did you want to hear today? That's the big question I have. And then this tiny URL down here, I've got this one in both my slides. I'm giving away two MyRio devices. Uh, this is entrance to a raffle. You just have to fill out my survey that you are here. Um, we're doing all of the GDevCon events under the GDPR rules, so data privacy is a thing, uh, which means I don't get the attendance list from Sam. This is my way of having you guys voluntarily tell me that you're at my session, you appreciated the session, and you want to win a uh, MyRio device. All right, so I'm going to open it up for questions, and then um, Matthew or uh, Sapria, if you can tell me if there are questions from the group back in Austin. Yeah. So it seemed like there was just a little bit of a conflict in a couple of things you were saying. Like on the one hand, I think you were saying that you had feature velocity that was kind of overcoming quality in various ways, but then also, you were saying that the desire to clean up ugly stuff was creating problems and you only should fix the things that you need to fix. 
Can you just say a little bit more about I don't know how you balanced that or why you felt there was a conflict there? Yeah, so the question for my team in Austin, if you didn't hear that question, um, the team is a, the, the question is about the balance between um, the velocity and the, the, the need to not, uh, not refactor absolutely everything, the focus on the things you need to do. And so I, I want to point out one thing that I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of these topics are all related to each other. Um, when we were brainstorming, we were looking for lots of different ideas. The, the buckets that we put them in were artificial so that I could uh, have some chance at giving you categories that we could talk about. So that point in particular is really important. Um, when we first started at Labio and XG, it was all about the velocity. We got to go fast. It was the only focus. We just go fast, get all the features done. That's an abuse, and I'll acknowledge that for everybody who was on that dev team. Um, it wasn't only about that, but it, that was the main focus, right? focus on velocity. Over time, we said, it can't just be about velocity, and that's where that uh, phrase, the sustainable velocity. If we'd have started from the beginning saying sustainable velocity, what we would have done is say, okay, sustainable velocity means I got to keep the code healthy, so I can't just go fast. I have to go fast, but I have to balance that keep, against keep the code healthy and you know, do rework when it needs to be done. But I can't just, I, I can't go all the way to the other extreme of like, only focus on the code quality and make everything perfect. That's too far the other direction. It's a balance between the two. You have to go fast as a sustainable velocity, but you also have to balance that against the health of the code and you need to do both. So you gotta balance the two things against each other. Um, and if, if there's a comment from the team at NI, okay. Yep, uh, there's lots of hands, Brian. Or Jim, whoever's got the microphone. I've got a microphone. Uh, okay, Jim has a microphone. <laughs> so I was curious um, to what extent you've solicited feedback from the community about why NXG failed and in the post-mortem process? So the current post-mortem that you just saw, Jim, Jim's question was about have we solicited from the community on why LabVIEW and XG failed? And the answer to that right now is that's why I'm here. <laughs> so we're, we're starting with the solicit from feedback from here, but we had to start with here's what we've done inside NI to give you a starting, like here's a foundation to work from. So. Um, I, I fully expect for us to then uh, translate that into discussions like this one, which you heard in Omid's answer uh, at the beginning. We wanted to start with community events like this one. Like we, as an example, we didn't do this session when we did NI Connect earlier this year, which was our, our replacement for NI Week, right? Um, we intentionally said we, we're, we could do a session there, but we're not. We're gonna do these sessions starting at the community events that are gonna happen later on in the year. Okay, yeah, thanks for that answer. The, the kind of the follow-up, and I'm willing to wait, I'm curious how the lessons learned are carried forward, and I know tomorrow you're gonna give a presentation on like what's next for LabVIEW. And so like the thought slash care about for me was how can we, the community, get our feedback about lessons learned from NXG so that NI can also learn from us in terms of its decisions about how to move forward with, with LabVIEW. Yeah, okay, so Jim's question, just for the NI team, um, is uh, how do we make sure that the community's feedback is, is getting into NI so that we continue that forward? You will see me do that very, th so I think it's a good plant question, and I've got money for you later for making sure to cover that. Tomorrow's session is, all g is gonna cover that in spades, but um, you heard Om the way Omid introduced this session, like he's looking forward to the dev team, he runs the dev team. The dev team is looking forward to hearing your feedback from the NI team that's here. So part of our job for being at this event, other than just being the sponsor, a, being one of the sponsors is to collect feedback on this session, on other things that we have, and so you know we're very explicitly saying, give us the feedback now. We, we're, you know, I, I talked about that. We need to listen, right? Listen more was one of the things that we took away from that. Um, and this is our uh, engagement of, okay, let us share with you everything that we know internally, and then have you share with us everything you're willing to anyway, about what we need to hear from externally. That's part of the outside in. Um, versus inside out uh, mentality. Does that answer your question, Jim? Yeah, and I guess if you're, you're requesting feedback, if there's a specific set of questions or perspectives or relationships that you're interested in hearing from the community, then that's something that we would like to hear from the community. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to lo load this slide. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not going to go that far, Jim. Um, <laughs> But I am in this hotel. You, will, you can ambush me lots of places here. All right, so I'm going to give you this last one up at the top. This is my, uh, if you've ever used Poll Everywhere, 
Um, it's a technology I'm going to use extensively tomorrow, so this is my good first attempt at using this. In this poll everywhere, I've asked you very explicitly, tell me about this session. Was it a good thing? Like, first of all, can I get a show of hands? Are you guys glad we did this session? Okay, 100%. Cool. All right, so um, then I ask for feedback on, like, what else could we tell you? What did you not hear that you wanted to hear? Or what discussions do we need to start that we haven't started? Like, it starts the same way that we started it at NI, which is give us all the feedback, all the things, all your bases belong to us. Um, give us all the feedback, and then we will come back and look at, all right, how do we, like, synthesize that down and then help us iterate on this? So it's a, it's a very legitimate um, question for you to ask, Jim, and I appreciate it. So th this, is, this is how we start that engagement. Brian. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to save my more provocative questions and comments for... <laughs> Uh, a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Thank you. Um, uh, but I did have, and maybe this is something you're going to answer tomorrow, but like the, the, I've used the G-Web software recently. Yes. And it's clear that the way you extend it is in XG. I've, I've read your feedback. And so, and so like what's, what's the plan for, um, you know, okay, you've built a lot of this technology on an XG that's dependent on some of those things. How do you resolve, are you pulling that back into the, current gen world, or are you pushing LabVIEW into those future things, or you, how yeah. does that resolve itself? Okay, so Brian's question is all over the place, but it started with the G-Web development software, and then it ended with what are we doing with LabVIEW. Um, so I'll talk about it in, in phases. Um, for G-Web development, it does use NXG's editor, but if you've used that tool versus the LabVIEW NXG version of that tool, first of all, it's like one-eighth the size, like we, we gutted um, everything out of it and made it, this is just the G-Web development software. It's going to stand alone by itself and we'll, we'll continue to modify its editor to make that a better like thin client development tool. That's what it is. You're building thin client web interfaces for your test measurement software. Um, over time, that will become better integrated with LabVIEW and with the other parts of our software platform. So it's also looking at it from, remember I talked about like old NI, the center of the universe is LabVIEW and everything will go through it. New NI, LabVIEW is important for doing test and measurement applications, but it actually is part of a larger ecosystem and you're gonna see us expand and include that larger ecosystem too, right? So um, now for the, the last part of your question was I think very specifically about like what other pieces of LabVIEW next year we're gonna pull back into LabVIEW. I have a question about that engagement tomorrow. I encourage everybody to come talk to me about your thoughts on that, but um, we're gonna spend <laughs> the entirety of whatever that question is, it's question seven in my list, um, talking about it as you guys answer it. You can see that this software actually shows me there's people already logging in and filling out the survey. Um, all of these questions are meant to be interactive, so tomorrow you'll see people's answers and we'll get a chance to engage in the dialogue. That's actually how we built the session, so I'll, I'll defer some part of that. But yes, we are exploring how we, what other pieces of uh, what we built in LabVIEW and XG can we pull back into LabVIEW and not just LabVIEW, but other pieces of the software that we're building right now. And more on the G web. How do you think this thing is built out of it? And it requires extensibility because it's very constrained. Yep. So you've now gotten rid of the way you extend it. So you have to invent a new way to extend it. What's that going to be? Okay. Fair. And I don't, you don't have to answer I'm, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> but you can come talk to me about it at dinner tonight. All right. Um, other questions? There's a lot of people with hands up here. Oh, you have a mic, okay, so you can go first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to applaud the outside in. It would have been very easy to just let this go down the memory hole. Thank you. Um, what is, and this may be a services question, but what is NI's commitment to educating their customers? I'm a CLA, CPI, CLED, and I have a LabVIEW and NI tool learning list that continues to grow. And there is a learning debt that's following all of this as NI evolves and introduces new products. And I think the customers need a huge commitment to the customer education. And obviously I'm biased because I'm a CPI, but um, I'd just like a reflection on that. Okay, so for the team back in Austin, the question is about um, how NI is engaging and committed to um, customer education and like, services related to keeping um, our, our customer base um, well-educated on how to do the right things. And I, is your question only about LabVIEW or is it the bigger picture of just like good design? You hear lots of sessions today on good design patterns. Like Every 
Okay, so, okay, great, this is a certified instructor. Right. Right, so the question is about learning path. I think Nancy is going to uh, provide some cover for me here because you're, now you're outside of my uh, realm of expertise. And <laughs> now it's in my little realm. <laughs> I, I don't work for um, our education services department, but I work closely with them. And you have, I can answer part of it. I can't answer the whole part. Um, and, the, and the whole part is to what degree are we really funding and making sure that we can cover absolutely everything? I don't have a good answer for you on that. I'm happy to chat with that team. Um, we have a new director there who's been there for about nine months or so. She's doing a great job at really uh, figuring out what we want to do moving forward. What you're going to see is we are outsourcing some of our training um, to people who are really good at developing it. And they're developing courses that are truly modular and courses that will be easier to extend. So with the LabVIEW test and course that we're developing, they're developing, they're designing it so that, oh, there's a new feature. We, we can extend that without going through this whole instructor-led training. So it's not going to be a book that gets um, manufactured somewhere that's difficult with a heavy lift. It is going to be part instructor-led, part online, so that we can update things more quickly. They have a good infrastructure in place to facilitate that as well. Um, and part of what I know uh, Education Services wants to do is do more customized courses in the future as well and bring in other people who can contribute. So there are efforts in place. I'm seeing what's happening. Hopefully you guys will see what's happening, but you still ask a really, really good question that I want to follow up on. Okay, we have time. Like, I'm getting the five-minute hook mark over here, so we got time for like one or two more questions. People have somebody... Did you still have a question? Hey, Bill, right here, and then, uh, then back there in the red shirt, and then I think that's all the time I'm gonna have questions for. Yeah. So kind of related to the last question, I feel like um, NI has done a lot of, you know, reorganization recently. Your presentation shows that you've done a lot of great work internally doing that. Uh, for a lot of external customers and like uh, developers who are reaching out to NI, it becomes very confusing. Like um, I've had so many different contacts over the past few years, and I'm constantly being shuffled around between different people who are like, oh, now we're doing it this way, it's broken up by industry, now your rep is, we haven't chosen the rep yet, but we'll get back to you when we have somebody to talk to. And uh, this is symptomatic of, I think, a lot of times I feel like an afterthought. Um, you know, I don't necessarily work for the biggest companies. I'm not bringing you those multi-billion dollar contracts. And I'm often coming to you with very complicated questions that would, the ROI is not necessarily there, honestly. I understand why. You know, um, I'm coming to you with a really obscure build question where if you Google it, the only thing that comes up is my lava post. And there's no other information, right? So I, I, I guess, is there a drive at NI or w is there an interest in, at NI to addressing kind of um, re really technical enthusiasts who, you know, we don't necessarily, we can't get, show you in dollars, like, you know, help us out and you're gonna, this is going to hit your bottom line. But we are also some of the most enthusiastic like, uh, people saying LabVIEW is amazing, NI is a great platform to build um, your company on. Um, and that's not tangible in dollars, but I've definitely felt a little bit neglected um, in recent years. And I'm wondering if, if that feedback has reached NI. Yep. Um, so team in Austin, this question is related to how NI is currently engaging 
uh, with partners like everybody that's in this room, um, but actually just as a whole, how NI engages with its uh, user base. Uh, at this point, it's become confusing through the transitions, especially the last couple of years we've been through a couple of them. All right, um, Nancy talked to this a little bit. We are going through a series of changes trying to uh, figure out how to most effectively do certain things. The area that you're asking about right now is most commonly referred to as developer relations, which is how we build up uh, reputations, um, kind of grassroots efforts, right? Um, there are a team of us that are very passionate about it. Uh, you're talking to one of them. This is why I run the LabVIEW Champions group. So we talked about that and people that join here. That's generally the role that I have uh, for that group, for the LabVIEW Champions, or people who are enthusiastic and passionate and learning how NI can better engage with them and make them more successful. You talked about, there's a couple of things that I'm gonna touch on because you, you hit on a lot of my buttons. Um, can I talk about the ROI of that group? I absolutely can. Nancy and I have gotten pretty good at it over the last couple of years of like, here's the ROI when you talk about developer relations, that's important. I will confirm that that is an area that we're discussing within an eye of like, there's some things we've figured out, we know we're gonna do. And then there's some stuff where we're like, we know that's important. We don't, we, we acknowledge that we're not yet really good at it and we're trying to figure it out. This is one of them. Um, trying to figure out how, did, how do we interact with everybody. Some cups, companies we've figured out we know how to interact with. Some partners and individuals, we figured out we know how to interact with. We have a very specific focus. We understand what we're doing. And then there's everybody else. And we're like, okay, we're, we, we still have some room to grow. And part of that is conferences like this. It's one of the reasons why and I sponsored this event. We're sponsoring the GLA later this year. We'll be sponsoring GDevCon in Europe later on. So th that's why we do these things is we're trying to figure it out. And we know we knew, need your input to help us do that. And we also need your input in a lot of cases to even point out where some of the problems are. That, that, that's real, um, but we're happy to engage. Everybody here that's got an NI badge, raise your hand. This team would love to talk to you at any point during this conference while you're here. Okay, that's it. All right, and last question before I totally get hooked off the stage. Yeah, I'm just curious if you feel like NXG was doomed from the start as a product <laughs> or if you know, things had gone differently, if, if maybe there was a success no, no. story there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, team at NI, if you didn't hear that one, the question was, do we think that LabVIEW NXG was doomed from the start? Um, and Brian Powell, who's sitting in the front row heckling me, would like to know if he can answer it on my behalf, which I've declined. <laughs> so so let, me, let me tell you this. Um, LabVIEW NXG, uh, that was, I'm, I'm going to best classify it up here. This, it was a learning experience for us. There were some really cool things that we were doing with LabVIEW NXG. It is not, it was not, I'm going to use the word just a failure. It failed, and we acknowledged that by doing sessions like that. Here's a lesson learned. We actually killed the product, um, but there was a lot of good stuff that we learned there. There was a lot of good process stuff. I talked about it in here, and that absolutely we're continuing. That's going to drive how we do all of our development going forward, and it makes us much more efficient. The reason we moved to that quarter-based development system is it actually allows us to engage with I don't know how many people realize that when we were building when we we're doing LabVIEW development and you came to us at NI Week and said hey there's got this list of things I'd love to see in LabVIEW do you know how long it took us to actually put some of those things into LabVIEW yeah, years in some case but the earliest we could do it was at least a year and a half because here's how the schedule used to work NI Week was in August we'd already committed to all of our work through the end of the year and for part of next year. So we couldn't even think about what we would do until after that point, which means it's like two whole releases before we could do that work, unless you're Darren, in which case you just sneak it in anyway and nobody notices, <laughs> right? So you can all thank Darren, all the thanks that you gave to Darren, he, he always did stuff like that. But, so we changed the process and said, look, that's ridiculous. We have to be able to listen to people when they give us feedback, like at this session, and then immediately apply that. And that's that cycle based. I don't commit to work except on those cycle boundaries. So if you give me feedback now, the worst point, like the longest window of time before I could actually take action on it is only a six month window. Because I might already be committed to my current work for this three months, but then I could put it in the next cycle and it would be to you in the, in, at the end of that cycle, right? So that's very intentionally, these are the things that we learned. So it was a really, really useful and impactful thing. And then from a technology standpoint, I mean, we built all these other products on top of it. So there's, there's a lot of successful things. Was it doomed from the start? Um, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of things that there, the whole team, when we did the retrospective, looked back and said, I wish we'd have done this piece differently. There's a lot of that. Um, but in the end, no, I don't think it was a failure. I don't think it was doomed from the start, but um, ultimately it, it wasn't what we needed to be building. Let's go with that. 
All right, thanks everybody for your time, I appreciate it.